Hi everyone, welcome to this new video. Today we are going to keep working on this project in which we are using MLflow alongside with um, Hyperrot for model tuning. And today, instead of spending time writing the code, I have already prepared some code. Um, so the video is not about writing code. I'm just going to walk you through the, uh, the script I have prepared for this video. So first thing, we are importing all the necessary uh, libraries for this um, script. Here we have all the necessary elements from Scikit-learn to create a machine learning pipeline because I want to do this project as real as possible. Then we have a matrix to measure the performance of the model, uh, the components that we need from Hyperot, typing, this is for, for documentation, pandas, mlflow, and partial. Partial is something that we are going to use to pass additional parameters to the uh, function that we want to minimize. Remember that during the last video, we use fmin to uh, find the minimum of a function. And we only can pass the objective function, right? If we want to pass additional parameters, uh, we need to use something like partial. So the first function, get classification metrics. Uh, well, this is just a function to retrieve a dictionary with classification matrix, such as uh, accuracy, precision, recall, and F1 score. Then we have a scikit-learn pipeline. And here I'm using a colon transformer to include um, reprocessing steps, a simple imputer for numerical features, and a categorical encoder for categorical uh, features. Um, in this case, since we are working with an um, artificial data set and we know that all the features are numerical features, we don't really need this, but I am just adding um, this in the transformer pipeline because I wanted to showcase that we can use, sorry, showcase that scikit-learn can be used to create general pipelines. Then the pipeline with the preprocessing step um, the model, which in this case is going to be a random forest classifier from Sankiller. So as you can see here in the documentation, uh, we have a bunch of parameters, hyperparameters, match def, mean sample split, mean sample. So we have a lot of hyperparameters. Um, all these hyperparameters can be included in our search space. But for this video, I'm going to include only two. Then we have the objective function. This is what we want to minimize, right? Now, in addition to the parents dictionary, I am passing the training data and um, the name of the numerical features and the categorical features. Then let me walk you to this code. Here I am retrieving my pipeline, my Sankinel pipeline. Uh, here I need to do some pre-processing before uh, training the model of the pipeline because my random forest classifier needs a uh, integer for the parameters match def and n estimators. And I am passing a float here in the parents dictionary. So for the reason, I need to transform those floats into integer uh, before setting the parameters here in this uh, line using pipeline.setParents. Uh, now, here I am starting an MLflow run um, one thing that I want to highlight from here is that I am using this option nested equals true. And this is because uh, every iteration of our optimization process is going to be a uh, child run. Then I am training the pipeline using training data, getting some predictions, getting the classification matrix, logging the parents of the model, the classifier, logging the matrix, and finally logging the the model for this iteration. As you can see here, every iteration will have its own run ID. So I am including the run ID in the name of the model. And finally, I am returning um, the negative value of F1 score. Why negative? Well, because remember that for classifiers, we want a higher F1 score. And this, and in this case, in this video, we're going to minimize this function. So for the reason, we had to include the negative value. So we have the maximum absolute value of the F1 score. We can use other metrics, maybe uh, accuracy or precision, or maybe recall. But remember that 
F1 score is a good metric, especially when we are dealing with unbalanced data set and binary classification problems. Uh, you can try it with, let's say, recall, precision, or let's say uh, accuracy if you want. But F1 score or maybe recall, they are good metrics to measure the performance of classifier, classifiers. Okay, this is the main uh, script here. Let me go you to this. First, I am creating my artificial data set, um, splitting the data into training and testing data. I am getting the name of the features here. Then this is my search space. As I mentioned before, we are going to find uh, values only for the n estimators, the number of estimators, and match def. But you can try it with, let's say, uh, more hyperparameters. You can find more uh, information about the hyperparameters in the documentation of Sankilar, random forest classifier. So here, we know, for example, the n estimators is an integer, right? Um, match def is also an integer, but you may need, I don't know, float or a string, who knows? So now let's get working here. Now I am creating an ML flow experiment. It's called hyper experiment. And I started my parent run in this case. The run name is going to be hyperparameter optimization. Now here I'm using uh, fmin, right? And partial. Why I'm using partial? Because I want to pass additional parameters. Remember that before we were using uh, only the space. We were using we were doing something like this. Fmin, and then um, we were passing only Fn objective function, right? Now, with this configuration, um, this objective function will have access only to the search space, right? But we want to pass more, let's say, parameters. For the reason we are using partial. So we can pass uh, training data and this um, list, right? The, the name of the numerical features and the name of the categorical features. Uh, finally, we have here with this search space, uh, the algorithm is going to be TPE suggests, and this is only to indicate the, uh, uh, indicate to Hyperot, hey, use um, Bayesian optimization, the maximum number of evaluations, which means that we're going to have maximum 10 runs, and trials. As I mentioned before, trials is an object that Hyperot uses to track all the um, values that Hyperot, you know, uh, was using in previous iterations. And this is, you know, to help with the Bayesian, Bayesian search, basically. Um, now here, okay, once we have the best parameters, uh, here we are, do, we are going to do all the process again, get the Sankiller pipeline, um, transform those floats into integers, and train a pipeline using, in this case, the best parameters. And I am logging, in this case, the all the things that we need for this model. Log parameters, metrics, and the model. Now, finally, let's run this code and see what happens. This will create an experiment and start the optimization process. Now, this will take a time, so I'm just going to pause the video and go back once the optimization is done. It might take like maybe two or three minutes. Okay, we are almost done here. Um, it's been only like two minutes. Okay, we are done. Now let's go to the MailFlow UI and see what we have there. So let's go to Hyperot Experiment. Uh, here we have all pattern run, hyperparameter optimization. And we have 10 childs, right? Now, one of the, let's say, advantages of using MLflow is that we can compare the runs, maybe using the chart view, for example. Um, here, let's say that I want to see F1, right? Okay. It seems to be a really good model. All the iterations, uh, you know, show um, good performance. Let's try with another chart. Let's say here, Something like 
let's let's see how the accuracy looks like. Uh, maybe recall it's better recall. And ten rounds and time. Let's say ten. Okay, this is a time. A chart, and here we are. Um, we can see that the highest value is this one. Test recall 0.8a. Uh, but let's look at recall. Uh, sorry, I have F1 score. I'm going to create a new chart. Uh, yes, let's get a chart. Let's say I want test F1, yes. Sorry, here I want the, let's say, end estimators. Uh, y axis, I want F1 score. Okay. Let's okay see this chart. We can see the um, the F1 score increases with you know the number of estimators. It seems that for example the highest uh, F1 score uh, was reached um, for 200 and estimators, 200 estimators. So that means that the best model that is here, right, uh, will have 200 estimators. Let's look at that. There could be parameters. And estimator 200. That's awesome, I think. So now all these metrics are, let's say, very good, I could say. If we want to make this more complicated or, or more real, let's say, we can go to MLflow Utils and create our more real dataset. So, for example, here we have this function called create dataset. So, what we can do. Uh, is used maybe I should have used that as a parameter. There is something called class separation, and basically this indicates how separated the classes are between them. And uh, remember, since this is a classification problem, uh, the more separated the classes are, the easy is to classify them, right? So if I use let's say a value like 0 0.3, that means that the distance between classes is going to be very, let's say, small. Maybe they are going to overlap between them. So I'm going to try this to make the problem more complicated. Okay, just let me just finish this, and I'm going to run again the optimization process. And again, I'm going to uh, pause the video uh, and because it will take like two or three minutes. Okay, we are almost done. It's been only like three minutes. It seems that this time uh, it took more time. And the loss, which is the F1 score, is not that good. But let's see the rest of the runs. Okay, um, now let's go to the user interface and see what we have there. Mm -hmm. Hyperot experiment. This is my latest experiment. And let's compare everything here. Chart view. Okay, now this is still good. Let's say the um, it's not as good as before. But yes, we can see, let's say, some differences now. It's more, we have, let's say, okay, for example, recall. Recall is not that good. Let's look at precision, let's say. Um, maybe, let me just refresh this to scale. 0 0.7, it seems that the best is 0 0.8, the best are uh, wrong. I'm going to include precision here. Just let me add a new chart, scatter plot. Then let's say that I want the number of estimators here and I want the precision here. It doesn't look that good in this case, of course. 0 0.8, maybe it's something good, but it's different, right? That's precision. Um, now, here from this chart, we can see here that the best uh, F1, let me let me see if I can do something like uh, this. Oh no. Okay, here. This point here. Okay, just maybe just 
me just give me a quick second. This is the point that we can see here with the highest F1 score. Just let me. Okay, this is the the point, right? And now the N estimators is 160. Let's check the best um, wrong, which is this, right? Hyperparameter optimization. And let's look at parameters. And we know now N estimators is 160. Of course, this is because the data set changed, right? I make it more complicated. And now the N estimators is, let's say, a lower, right? Which I think that makes sense, right? Because if we reduce, um, if we decrease the number of estimators, uh, we are, let's say, making the model less prone, let's prone to, let's prone, sorry, let's prone to overfitting. With 200 estimators, maybe the model was memorizing some, let's say, results. But let's say with a lower number of estimators, we are allowing the model uh, um, to generalize in the data. OK, so that was everything for this video. Um, we, we saw that this optimization process is taking more time when the problem is more difficult, so maybe in another video, we can see how to perform this uh, hyperparameter optimization using a distributed framework like Spark. But that would be in a different video. Thanks for watching this video, and I'll see you in the next one.